Well, if you would, take your Bibles this morning and turn to Romans chapter 4 as we continue in our study of Romans. And uh, Romans chapter 4 is where we're going to pick up, and uh, we're going to look at verses 13 and following today. But uh, what a way to introduce this next text of Scripture. Um, by looking back at the previous two verses, um, chapter 4, verses 7 and 8 says, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. When I think about that as a, as a preface of coming into our text of Scripture for this week, beginning verse 9 and following, 9 through 17, that is amazing to me. He says, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Did you hear that? It says blessed. I mean, think about that just for a moment. Blessed. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us in this room, if we know Jesus Christ, if we've had our sins forgiven, if our sin has been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, and you've been justified, it's just as if I'd what? Never sinned. Think about that for a minute. He says, blessed. In other words, if God has forgiven you, and he has, according to 1 John 1, he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you have experienced that forgiveness, if you have been justified, he says, no longer are your sins held against you. You are what? Blessed. Forgiven. That's what he's saying here. Blessed is the, are those whose lawless deeds. And trust me, every one of us have experienced and do experience lawless deeds. In other words, things that we've done that are sinful. Things that we know do not please the heart of God. Things that we know break heart, God's, God's heart. In fact, God's Word puts it this way in Psalms. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our sins from us, Right? So we've, if we've experienced God's grace and His forgiveness, we are blessed. Think about that just for a moment. Blessed is a man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. In other words, every time that we, you know, we, if we consider the sinfulness of our own hearts, if we, if we consider the sinfulness of our flesh, God says it's though I'm not taking it into account every time you do it. Now, we have an obligation, don't we, according to 1 John? We have to confess our sins, repent of it, and don't make it a part of our daily routine. We're supposed to re, you know, be holy and righteous and, 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 and turn away from sin. That's true. But I'm so thankful that we also are blessed in the sense that God has forgiven us. We're ex we experience His grace and His mercy every single day. How does that apply to where we live? I mean, we've been talking about the law for the last how many weeks, right? We've been talking about the law that, you know, somehow the Jewish folks thought that they were somehow going to be in a better standing before God because they were given the law, because they knew all the rules and the regulations and the guidelines inside and out, because they knew what the, it had become a ritual. And now today we look at one more aspect of their ritual knowledge, their cultural uh, standing and what they had to do to gain their justification and their and, there, uh, and so forth. But we are blessed. In fact, what he is talking about here in Romans chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, is really a reiteration of what David was expressing back in Psalm chapter 32. In Psalm 32, David is, is just really, he's just overwhelmed with gratitude and joy because he's experienced God's forgiveness. The assurance of God's forgiveness. That relief and that thankfulness over the forgiveness of sin ought to overwhelm every one of us. I've said many times, and I'll say it many more times, Paul said he was the chiefest of sinners. Any one of us who understands and realizes the significance of our own sinfulness, how vast or how small you may think that may be, we ought to understand how great God's grace is. We have been forgiven. And as we come into this next text of Scripture, we'll see two aspects of Abraham's justification. The first one is found in verses 9 through 12, and it's this. Abraham's justification was not based on circumcision. And then secondly, Abraham's uh, justification was not based on the law, verses 13 through 17. 
But first of all, Abraham's justification was not based on the right of circumcision. Remember, according to verse 3, chapter 4, verse 3 says, For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God and was counted to him as righteousness. You see, Abraham was considered the father of, what, many nations, that his seed was multiplied, but even though he was considered the father of the Jewish people, he never was justified because of circumcision. He was justified by his faith. He says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as for righteousness. So Abraham was a man of faith. And if you don't think he was, just for a moment, put yourself in his sandals. Just, just briefly, put yourself in his sandals. Can you imagine in 2021, God saying so clearly to you, I want you to get in your car and I want you just to pack up and go. Well, where am I going, God? I don't know. Just go. I'll let you know when you get there. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, you're going to load up the, uh, you know, the Brady Bunch station wagon with all your stuff and just head out. I'll let you know when you get there. No, really, Abraham, I want you to load up the camel, get your sandals and your bedding and go. I'll let you know when you arrive. Don't think he was a man of faith? Absolutely a man of faith. And we're going to see more of that in just a few moments. But Abraham lived in a culture or a mindset of one who knew, practiced, and understood what it meant to need, quote-unquote, circumcision. So they understood the, the acceptable order, the process of spiritual growth. Well, yeah, you should have faith. You should trust God. And, and yes, you should be justified, but, but circumcision is, is necessary. So he understood the need culturally and even scripturally to understand the need, quote-unquote, to be circumcised. But circumcision for many had become a ritualistic passage, so to speak, especially to the Jewish people. So let's just for a moment, let's go to our passage here in Romans chapter 4 and read verses 9 through 17. It says, Therefore, is this blessing on the circumcised or the uncircumcised also, for we say, faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Well, not while he was circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be counted to him. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also are following the steps of faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. <sighs> Is that a tongue twister for anyone else? Circumcised, uncircumcised, the circumcision, uncircumcision, blah, 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 blah. We'll go back and we'll break it down. Verse 13. For the promise to Abraham or to his seed that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith has been made empty and the promise has been abolished. For the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there is no trespass. For this reason, it is by faith in order that it may be according to grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are in the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, a father of many nations have I made you in the presence of him whom he, whom he believed, even God who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. So, Abraham understood what it meant to quote-unquote need to be circumcised. And yet, he was not justified by being circumcised, but by his faith. You see, they no longer needed the outward quote-unquote signs that came from circumcision. Why? Because faith had prevailed. You don't see salvation in the Old Testament. There's still faith in the Old Testament. There's still belief in God in the Old Testament salvation in the Old Testament. In fact, in Galatians chapter 3, just for a moment, I'll turn over there. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Galatians chapter 3. I want to read verses 15 through 18 just for a moment. It says, Brothers, I speak in human terms. Even though it is only a man's covenant, talking about the promise here, yet when he has been ratified, no one sees it or sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. 
He does not say, and to his seeds, plural, I mean, that word plural, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. And what I am saying is this, the law which came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to abolish the promise. For the inheritance is by law, it is no longer by promise, but God has granted it to Abraham through promise. So the first thing we see here is that Abraham's justification was not based on his circumcision. Because why? The law didn't come till 430 some years later. So it wasn't through the outward process. It wasn't through the ritualistic rite in becoming a Jew. See, to the Jews though, that was very important because every good Jew was circumcised what? The eighth day. And that gave them bragging rights, so to speak. It gave them the ability to see, see, hey, I'm one of these. I actually followed through. I followed the law. And yet Abraham, being the father of the Jewish people, what? 400 years later is when it came. So, once again, do you kind of almost see a little bit of Ephesians 2, 8, 9 in this passage? So it wasn't by works that we could do. It says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that what? Not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So here you're seeing from the Old Testament a picture of your works cannot save you. Your works will never save you. Your works are not good enough to save you. And once again, if faith were not needed, then, well, faith is useless. If I don't have to trust Jesus Christ, what good is faith? I don't have, I have no need for it. So he's making a point here. That Abraham, being the father of the Jewish nation, was not based, his righteousness was not based, or his justification was not based on his circumcision. And number two, Abraham's justification was not based on the law. It's interesting to know that Abraham was, once again, 400 years later when the law came. So one might argue that Abraham's justification was because he fulfilled all the requirements of the law. I mean, he being the father, he would know all the do's and the don'ts, right? He would know all the celebratory feasts that he should be a part of. He would know all the guidelines that he were to, to be expected to follow. But if you look at verse 13, it says this, For the promise to Abraham, or to his seed, that he would be heir of the world, was not through the law. So he very specifically says, it's not because of the law. It's not because of what you did or didn't do that you're justified. But he says, but through the righteousness of faith. His faith is what made him justified. So the promise was not through the law. And now we see why in verses 14 and 15. It says, for if those who are of the law are heirs, faith has been made empty. And the promise has been abolished. In other words, of no good. There's no effect. So he says, if you're depending on the law, faith has made empty empty or void in other words it's useless and of no value he says if it's because what you can do well then what what does faith matter if it, to trust in something no, it doesn't matter it's useless it's, it's of no value if it's off what if it's based off what you can do but we're reminded over and over that the law is what it's a reminder in fact galatians says it's a schoolmaster to bring us to what Grace. See, every time you look at these rules, whether it's one or a thousand and one, every time you look at those rules, you realize, you know what? Man, I, I try not to break that one, but I'm guilty. I try not to go against that one, but I'm, I, I, I've gone against it. Every time you break a rule, it's a reminder that you what? Can't keep them. So he says what the law could not do Faith, so to speak, comes in, fills in the gap because it's faith in what Jesus Christ has done, not what you can do. So over and over, it's a reminder that this law was a schoolmaster to bring us to grace, to reminder that God's grace is sufficient. And we're going to see more of that in just a moment. Faith has prevailed, as we said in verse 12. But look at verse 15. It says, For the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there is also no trespass. So, if you make the promise dependent upon the law, it's to nullify the promise, but the law brings about wrath. It brings men under condemnation, which is the opposite of what God had intended through His grace. Law then hinges on justice, whereby promise hinges on grace. Let me say it again. Law hinges on justice. 
promise hinges on grace. He made a promise, he made a covenant, and he'll fulfill his promise, right? That's where his grace steps in. But he says, where there is no law, there is no sin or trespass of the law. Let me just give you another paraphrase of that just for a moment. The Living Bible puts it this way, and I don't preach from the Living Bible, but I like how this verse is phrased. He says, the only way we can keep from breaking the law is to not have any laws to break. True? Because as long as there's a law, you're going to break it. And the only way not to break a law is there, for there to be no law to break. That's what he's saying there in verse 15. For the law brings about wrath. The law brings about the fact that there has to be justice for the law that is broken. But where there is no law, there is no trespass. There's no crossing of it if you don't break it. So the reality is, there is a law. And the law is a reminder that brings us to God's grace. He says, for this reason it is by faith that it may be according to grace. So that the promise will be guaranteed to all. Look at verse 16. It says, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Once again, do you not see a picture of John 3.16 in this verse? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave. And He's reminding us in Romans chapter 4 and verse 16 at the end of it, so not only to those who are under the law, so there are those who said, but hey Abraham, we have to be circumcised. We have to keep the law. So He says, if you're of that camp, or whether you're of the camp that says, I have faith in Abraham. All of us included, every one of us, are, percip- are, are, are recipients of God's grace. All of us have the opportunity to come to Him through grace. Now you have to know something. You're keeping the law is not going to get you any further ahead. But you're still a recipient of my grace. Look at verse 17. It says, as it is written, a father of many nations have I made you. In the presence of him whom he believed, even God who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. In that Hebrews 11? Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Right? So they're automatically saying, this is faith. Father of many nations have I made you. Not am I going to make you, is that I've already made you this. But also those, uh, or, or verse, uh, middle of the verse, even God who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which is not as this, in hope against hope, he believed. What is in hope against hope? I'm just going to tell you, as I kind of did some research on that phrase, I, I wasn't satisfied with anything that I found. I just wasn't. Here's what I think it means. I want to believe, and I don't know how it's all going to work out, but I'm choosing to believe. I, I, I don't know how it's going to work. I, I don't see how it's going to unfold. But okay, God, I'm going to trust you that what you're saying is true. Hope against hope. You see, against part, we understand, because we understand when something's against something, we understand that. And what is against here is the logic and the rationale and the idea that something was going to happen. Here's why. Look on next verse. Or the beginning of the verse. In hope against hope, he believed so that he might become a father of many nations. According to that which he had spoken, so shall your seed be. And without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body. What does the word contemplate mean? Just think about that in your mind just for a moment. Contemplate means to think it through. Just think about this. Just Just camp right there for a moment. He's camping out, contemplating his own body. You say, well, what what does that have to do with anything? Read on. Verse 19, And without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead. Why? Why? 
I mean, Abraham's more than 100 years old here, and he's looking at his own body and saying, I'm as good as dead. Since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Why? I'm contemplating how old I am. Is anybody getting younger in here, by the way? Nobody's getting any younger. And oftentimes you'll, you'll hear of somebody getting pregnant in their 30s, and you say, yeah, they're at the end of their childbearing years. And then all of a sudden someone who's 40 or 45 has a baby, and they're thinking, that's awesome, that's great. But 100? No, thank you. Don't sign me up for that. I don't even want a teen. If you're having a baby at 100, that means you're going to have teenagers at 100 and 113. No way. Don't want it. He's looking at the circumstance. He's just being realistic, right? He's just being rational. My body and my wife's body, we might as well be good as dead. Nobody has babies at 100 years old. And God, I hope against hope. I, I don't understand how you're going to do it, God, but okay, I, I, I trust you. Yet, verse 20, with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief. Stop right there. Anybody ever waver in their unbelief? I have. I can look back in times in my life and I can see, man, I had some incredibly great faith. At least what I thought was great faith. I remember that one of the most distinct times that I had faith that God was going to provide a need. College years. Freshman year. I'm out of cash and I need to wash some laundry. <laughs> and I remember saying, Lord, I just need $3. I need $3 to wash my clothes. Lord, I need money. Okay, hey Lord, I don't know how you're going to do it, but I, I, I need money. I, I know you're going to take care of it. And I go, after my last hour, last hour before lunch, I go to the mailbox, and it would be an envelope with $3 in it. I didn't tell anybody that I needed $3 for my laundry. Nobody knew but God. And He took care of it. You know what that does in a bigger picture of our life? If God can take care of that, He can take care of other things that are bigger. And if you don't trust Him for the little things, you'll never trust Him for the big things. And I wish I could say my entire life has been based off that. But there have been times that my faith has wavered. There's never been a doubt in my mind that God could do something, but I've wavered in the fact of whether or not I really expected Him and trusted Him that He would. And I'm sitting here looking at this story and I'm reminded. Abraham is being told he's going to be the father of many nations. That his seed is going to be multiplied. And Abraham is looking realistically, rationally, at his own life, his own body, and the body of his wife. And we're saying we're 100 years old. Hope against hope. But okay, God. And it says his faith did not waver. That's amazing to me. Verse 20, he did not waver in unbelief, but, here's the deal, grew strong in faith. Not only did he not waver, but he grew stronger in his faith. And then, here's the key, giving glory to God. When's the last time that God has put us through an opportunity to exercise our faith and our faith did not waver, become stronger, and then God got glory through it? That's real. That's real. I'm going to break on you just for a minute, Jen. The night Jen found out she had cancer, that very night, we're at Thompson Hospital in her room. The doctor came in and said, there's a spot on her brain. She has cancer. I looked right at her. You remember what I said? Now, how are you going to glorify God through this trial? And they did it. Every day was a test. Every day was a, 
I'm going to get through this. I'm trusting God. And as God gave them each day, their faith grew. And they glorified God through that. There's a million stories there. But how often do we have an opportunity to take God at His Word, to not let our faith waver, to actually grow during the trial or the circumstance, the situation that God has allowed, and then God get glorified in the end. That's awesome. What an example to all of us that Abraham gave to us. Yet, with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. Verse 21, And being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able to do. Do we have that kind of faith? Do we have that kind of faith that what God promises, He will fulfill? And once again, verse 22, Therefore it was accounted to Him as righteousness. Now, not for His sake only was it written that it was counted to Him, but for our sake also. He said this was not just for Abraham so that Abraham would grow in his confidence towards God. He says this is not only for him, but it's for us as well. You know who us is? Every one of us. Every one of us. But for our sake also, to whom it will be counted as those who believe upon him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. Verse 25. He who was delivered over on account of our transgressions, and was raised on account of our justification. Jesus. Delivered over because of our transgressions. You know, transgressions are sins. Isaiah talks about by, because of our transgressions, he was beaten. We transgressed the law. We could not keep the law. We were sinners. Our sinners. He says, because of our sin, He was delivered over and was raised on account of our our justification. Isn't that awesome? The story of Abraham still lives on. Hundreds and hundreds of years later, the work of Jesus Christ still lives on. What He did once and for all is a supreme sacrifice in bringing us to the grace of Jesus Christ through salvation, still lives on. Can you see the work of Abraham, how important it is to learn from it, to apply it? There are always going to be those who think that they're not good enough, that they couldn't earn it, that they don't deserve it. And guess what? They're 100% right. You don't earn it, you don't deserve it, and you can't work for it. But that's where God's grace steps in. But here's the question. A couple things here. Number one, if you're still trying to work your way to Jesus, you're never going to be able to do it. You can't do it. There's nothing you can do to get more of God's love. There's nothing you can do to merit more of His love and favor than what He's already given you. He loves you. You can't work for it. You can't earn it. He loves you. And yet there are those who are going to continuously try to work for it. Look at it as a relationship. When you love somebody, you serve them. You do what pleases them. You do what brings them joy. Not because you have to, but because you love them. That's the relationship that we can have with Jesus. He loves us. And because of that love, we want to serve Him and please Him and obey Him. Number two, when we look at the idea of faith, is your faith wavering in what God has spoken to you? Or is it growing? Because God will do what He says He's going to do. He's faithful. 
Lord, we thank you that you are a great God. God, we thank you that you make no mistakes. We thank you that you are a man of your word, a God of your word. Even sometimes when it doesn't look like things are going to work out. When from our perspective it doesn't make sense. Might our faith grow in those circumstances. God, I pray that you would speak to all of our hearts. Help us to realize how much you do love us. How much you are willing to give and sacrifice so that we might have a relationship with you. Or might we realize, Lord, that everything you do is for our good and your glory. Might our faith increase and grow and not waver during difficult days. And even in good days, at taking you at your word. Speak to our hearts, we pray, Lord. His heads are bowed and eyes are closed just for a simple, this morning, simple opportunity this morning as we do each and every week, an opportunity to respond to God's word. I don't doubt for a moment that there are many in this room that try to do good who try to work for the Lord, who try to keep all the, the rules and regulations of what they think it means to be a Christian, just to do this, do this, don't do this, don't do that. And you're trying to earn a standing with God that you cannot earn. Can I just challenge you? Jesus loves you as you are. And when we repent of our sins and turn our faith and trust in Him, He forgives and cleanses us. And number two, when God speaks, He fulfills His promise. And sometimes our faith wavers rather than getting stronger. You say, Pastor Ken, that's, that's me. I'm challenged by the message. I need a reminder that Jesus loves me and that I need to increase in faith during difficult times. Pastor, pray for me. That's my desire. Yes, in the back over here, on the side. Yes, right here. Anyone else say, Pastor, that's me. I need to increase in my faith. I need to trust Jesus more. Pray for me. Anyone like that? Yes, over here, on the side. Can I just challenge all of us who are here this morning? So much of what Abraham was living out in the Old Testament is reiterated and solidified in the New Testament. Works will never save you. Rituals will never save you. Traditions will never save you. But faith in Jesus Christ will save you. Saving faith and sustaining faith. Faith to trust what he's done for us on the cross and faith to trust him day by day. Saving faith and sustaining faith. I challenge you who have raised your hands, your hearts this morning to trust him. To take a moment and pray. And ask God to help you be a little bit more like Abraham. To trust God. To take him at his word. That he will fulfill his promise to each and every one of us. Lord Jesus, I pray for each one who raised their hand, their heart towards you this morning. Simple passage, Lord. Abraham reminded the Jewish people, Lord, not by works, not by circumcision, not by the law, but his faith. Lord God, might we have faith in you, trust you. Saving faith and sustaining faith. Lord God, would you work in our hearts to draw us close to you. Be with each one who raised their hand and heart towards you, Lord, that they might... Lord, truly have the faith of the need, Lord, to, to see your hand at work each and every day of their lives. That we would trust you in all things. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.